Hi, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist. It's nice to see you again. And if you're joining us for the first time, then welcome. This is, this is the channel where I talk about all things geological and, and fossils and whatnot. Really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button, uh, give us a thumbs up and the notification bell because I wouldn't want you to miss out on any of the videos that we've got coming up in the future. This week we're continuing on with our series of looking at minerals in hand specimen and we're going to go and have a look at the feldspars. Ooh, feldspars. Let's get started. So you might remember in our introduction video to minerals, we looked at, uh, at this little orthoclase crystal. I say a little, this is pretty big for an orthoclase crystal. And we mentioned that it was a feldspar. But what actually are feldspars? So if we go back to our quartz and we think of our silica minerals, silicon and oxygen, we add aluminium to that and we get minerals like kaolinite and dickite. But then if we start adding more aluminium, calcium, potassium, we start to get feldspars. And feldspars are a major rock forming mineral in igneous rocks. They melt at high temperatures and they're one of the first things that will start crystallizing out of a melt. And because of that, they're a major constituent of the Earth's crust. That's why it's important to understand the feldspars and to be able to recognize them in the field. Because if you're looking at a metamorphic or igneous terrain with metamorphic and igneous rocks, then you're gonna see a lot of feldspars and understanding them can help you understand the origin of those rocks and unravel the story of the geology that you're looking at. And that's really what you want. Yeah. Even if you don't know it, you've already seen feldspars, at least from quite a long way away. Whenever you look up at the moon, you're actually looking at a huge pile of basaltic rock that's crammed with feldspars. Those bright white areas on the moon are full of a feldspar called a northite. On Earth, the most common feldspars you're gonna encounter fall roughly into two camps. And that's gonna be these small white ones that are generally referred to as plagioclase or plage. <laughs> I've got no idea why that's so funny. And then you're gonna get these pink ones. These are usually orthoclase or microcline. They're not shortened to anything really. <laughs> the main difference between them is their composition. Plagioclase tends to be richer in things like sodium and calcium, and orthoclase and microcline tend to be richer in things like potassium. And that's because they have two different origins. They form from different kinds of magma that in turn have formed from the melting of different kinds of rocks. Plagioclases tend to be associated with basalts and other mafic rocks that have originally been derived from the melting of the mantle. Whereas the potassium rich feldspars tend to be derived from the melting of crustal rocks. So things like granites, granitic gneisses, granitic gneisses, granitic gneisses, and metasediments. Because of that, you tend to find them in different tectonic regimes. So you're gonna find your plagioclases wherever you're getting melting of the mantle. So things like mid-ocean ridges, hot spots, where you're getting lots of basaltic lava flumes. It's places like Iceland, places like uh, Hawaii, and then ancient and locations that were spreading centers in ancient times. Likewise, you're gonna find potassium rich feldspars wherever you're getting things like continental collisions and the melting of granitic rocks and crustal material. So places like magmatic arcs. They're not completely separate though. And there is a, what we call a solid solution between the two end members. They do cross over quite a bit. So you have to take into account all of the other bits of information that you find around the rock to, and the context of that rock to understand the true story of it. Like I keep saying, context is everything and you need to put all of the different bits of evidence together to get as close as you can to the actual story. So let's have a look at some specific feldspars now. Most of the time when you're out looking for rocks and minerals, you'll find feldspars like this in a ground mass of other minerals. So here we've got these nice big orthoclase crystals. Look at that one with all those little zoned patches in it. You can see it's growth in a mass of plagioclase crystals and quartz as well in this great this is a granite granite this is a granite it's very rare that you'll find large free crystals uh, there are some special places where you can't where you can find them for example if you're lucky enough to live in california or go up hiking in the sierra nevada mountains perhaps up nearby cathedral mountain you might find 
large orthoclase crystals like this one, not just in the big boulders of granite in and out of itself, but actually weathered out of the rock. As well as finding feldspars in intrusive rocks, you can also find feldspars in volcanic rocks. Here we have some material that was erupted out of a volcano. I don't know where. So we have these large sanadine and orthoclase crystals that were growing in the magma chamber, and they must have spent some time growing very, very slowly in the magma chamber because they're quite large. And then they've been erupted out. And as they've been erupted out, the rest of the magma has become lava and then cooled into this very fine ground mass. So as well as these big chunks of feldspar in there, full tabular feldspars, we've got all of these chunks of glass and tiny, tiny ground up bits and broken bits of feldspar as well. As well as in the more explosive types of volcanism, you can also find feldspars in the products of the runnier kind, like the sort of thing you'd see on Iceland or on Hawaii. In this example we've got here from the Isle of Skye, which about 50 million years ago was where the North Atlantic started to open and was where the, the hotspot that eventually became Iceland started out. We have this black basaltic ground mass and then these shiny thin bits here, which are the plagioclase crystals. And because basalt cools on the surface or quite near to the surface, the crystals in it tend to be quite small. So it's likely that these larger crystals cooled further down and then were brought up as the magma rose and eventually became the lava. If you were to stick this under a microscope, and look at it in thin section, it would be chock full of tiny little plagioclase feldspars, as well as pyroxenes, and maybe some olivine as well. As I mentioned, you can also get feldspars in metamorphic rocks, and they tend to reflect the chemistry and setting that the rock originally had. That's what we call the protolith. In this example here, these white bands and white flecks are all albite, and this is a mafic gneiss. This is from the Louisian gneiss of Northwest Scotland. This is about 3.2 billion years old. And this is probably metamorphosed ocean crust or something like that, maybe so something from the lower crust. Also from Northwest Scotland, from one of the scurry dikes, is we've got this metagranite. And we can see here, it's got this nice pink color and these white and pink orthoclase crystals in it and microcline. So that's great. But how do we actually identify them if we think we've got some feldspars? Well, generally the thing that's gonna give away a feldspar is its shape. If it's big enough to see, then you can probably have enough time to grow into a nice crystalline shape. So this is the classic feldspar. Here we've got another orthoclase and plagioclases don't tend to look too much different. There are some variations on this tabular shape with pointier ends, and but this is generally gonna be the, the classic feldspar shape. They also have this milky white color, but rather than be dull, they'll reflect the light when you get a nice crystal face. And if they've got other stuff stuck to them though, that can be quite hard to see. So it's easier to see in polished surfaces. So if you find a building, for example, that has granite stones in work in it, for on the front or on the steps, have a look at the feldspars there and you'll see their nice polished surfaces. You also might see some of the twinning that happens in feldspar crystals. Usually what you'll see is the crystal will reflect in two patches. So you'll have one straight reflection there and one there, and that's what we call the simple twinning or albite twinning. The color of feldspars tends to be this milky white variety. That's often plagioclase, but it can be orthoclase as well, which is a, one of the potassium rich feldspars. Normally the potassium rich feldspars are pink or they can be sort of dark burgundy red or a light salmon pink. Sa um, sanadine and andesite are sometimes like a light salmon pink. Sometimes it can be this beautiful green color. This is a nice large microcline crystal. You can see it's generally got that tabular shape. It's just a bit flatter and has, has more of a, a rhombohedral shape to it a little bit. Perhaps my favorite feldspar of all is labradorite, which is a type of plagioclase. And it has this, be it's generally black, but it has this beautiful Schiller iridescence, it's called. And this is often used as a build, decorative building stone. So if you ever see dark rocks with a sparkly, flat sparkly crystals in like this, then what you're probably looking at is a piece of gabbro or lava kite with lots of lovely labradorite feldspars. But remember, as I always say, you need to put all of the lines of evidence together. You can't just rely on one single piece of evidence to identify your minerals. So now you've got all of those different ways to identify feldspars, you can go out and find them yourself 
And as I said, the easiest place to find them is in polished building stones. But <clears throat> if you start going out further afield to look at rocks, you should have a good idea now. And most importantly, be able to distinguish them from quartz and calcite, which we've already looked at. So there we go. There's a brief introduction to the feldspars. They're often overlooked outside of igneous and metamorphic enthusiasts because they're one of the most common minerals, so people tend to discount them, but they really are quite fascinating and can tell us a huge amount of what's going on in places that we'll never ever get to see, like in metamorphic belts or inside a magma chamber deep under the earth. I hope you'll have fun now going out and looking for your own feldspars, or maybe looking at the rocks you've already collected and realising that you've now got some feldspars in them. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed learning about feldspars as much as I've enjoyed looking at them and telling you about them. And I hope that you go out and find lots of feldspars of your own. If you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you subscribe to the channel so we can have you along for more videos. And I wouldn't want you to miss out on the future videos about other mineral groups that we're gonna be looking at and the fossils and all of the other cool stuff that we're gonna be doing. Also, if you hit the notification bell, then you'll get an alert and that will tell you whenever I've put a new video up. So have you found any feldspars of your own? Do you think you might have some? Do you have any feldspar questions? You can pop them in the comments below and I'll have a look through and, and answer them. So until next time, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye. <laughs>